so yeah, I think it's it's probably a matter of of people that speak at least one other language just having a general interest in picking up more. But we also, I mean, one of the perks of working in Duolingo too is like we get access to a lot of the features and products um, before a lot of our learners do. It's been amazing because I am a firm believer in Duolingo's mission about accessibility in education and providing high quality education for free, right? Welcome to Business Ninjas, brought to you by Write For Me, where you'll hear from business leaders who are out there growing their business and slaying it every day. Learn from the masters. Let's get started. Hi, everybody. This is John Gerard, and I'm here with the Business Ninjas podcast, and we've got an amazing guest today with me. Katie Romdahl is joining us from Duolingo. Katie, so great to have you here. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I know you've got an incredible story to tell, and I want to get into it pretty quickly, but just so we sort of paint a picture, a uh, little bit of background, a little bit of context for for the story, the business story you're going to share. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you came from, and how you ended up at Duolingo. Yeah. So... A big part of my story is I was born of a daughter of a pharmacist, uh, native Bay Area, native to the Bay Area, California, and he grew up multilingual. He traveled a lot as a child, uh, spent a lot of time in Mexico where he picked up Spanish, and his ability to speak Spanish changed the trajectory of his career. It made him a very successful uh, pharmacy owner, business owner, and uh, as a result, my brother, sister, and I, we visited Mexico and also other international locations a lot as children. And I ended up in high school working at the pharmacy and using my kind of basic Spanish skills. And then I went on to participate in exchange programs and even did a year of college abroad. And so my Spanish skills really helped me launch a career for myself out of college, kind of leveraging the ability to be multilingual um, to get a job. Because it's really tough to get a job when you have no real life experience to speak of at age, what, 21 or so? Yeah, so that, it- Sorry to interrupt, but you know that that's amazing because that that ability to speak uh, conversationally or even fluently is a big differentiator, especially in America. Our, our our version of learning languages in grade school and high school is being able to count to eleven, probably not even twelve. And meanwhile, our counterparts in other parts of the globe are are you know know four languages by the time that they're twelve and can speak them fluently. Absolutely, absolutely gives them a big leg up. And and what I found is. You know, I moved from the Bay Area uh, that it's laughable now, so expensive, and, and an opportunity in Seattle came up for me to work for a board game company that did distribution all over the world, but primarily in Latin America. And so I am still here 16 years later in Seattle as a result of not a lot of people at the time, at least, having fluency in Spanish, English, and some Portuguese in Seattle, Washington. So Bay Area, maybe, but not so much Seattle. The, so right. So the um, if we were to segment that that group or that audience up in Seattle, there's like what six of you that that sort of knew that at that time. Something they're all related to me too. No, I don't know. But all connected in some. <laughs> so curious about the on, on the board game side. Were you doing translation or were you doing business in Spanish, Portuguese, that kind of thing? Yeah, fully business in Spanish. So my interview with uh, this former boss was in Spanish and he's also from the U.S. but similar to me had some kind of you know stuff in his life that that enabled him to learn Spanish and then that changed his career too and so what we did is we distributed but also produced our own board games we're a subsidiary of Hasbro um, doing all their sales in Latin America now it it amounted to like five or ten percent of their total sales and to Hasbro it was like yeah it's not a big deal why don't we like have this other subsidiary manage it for us and so we did all of that. And so my job was taking phone calls, writing invoices, creating marketing emails. And this is at the dawn of Twitter and social. So I like launched our social pages. Yep. Uh, everything was in Spanish. So no no English at that job at all. And, and some Portuguese, but we had Portuguese coworkers that were handling more of that than I was. That's amazing. Well, I suspect everyone can tell how this experience that you've had might lead its way to Duolingo. Um, but maybe tell us a little bit more about what happened from there to, to, to uh, land you at Duolingo. Yeah, I got lucky. I had a couple of jobs where, again, my foot in the door was that I spoke Spanish, um, but wasn't feeling too passionate about the sales world. I really found myself wanting to work in community initiatives or, or building events and connecting people. And so it wasn't a Spanish opportunity, but a role at Yelp in 2009 came up in Seattle and it was for, you know, a head of marketing position for the greater metro area of Seattle to sort of run 
uh, initiatives and campaigns and and sponsor events to bring more visibility to Yelp as a as a product or a platform or community to people in in the Seattle area. And so that was my first formal job in English. Um, so it was like my third job out of college. It was like finally using my uh, native language, and that job was amazing, uh, especially at that time in in sort of the tech world. There was just so much opportunity, and the community that I that I built. Uh, was was growing and it was exciting. And I was there for a number of years, even to when, uh, even helped launch when when Yelp uh, expanded and moved to Europe. Mm-hmm. I, I raised my hand for an opportunity to help start with a little bit of translation to do a launch for us in Spain uh, mm-hmm. before they hired international teammates. But yeah, Yelp didn't have quite the, the language opportunities, but cut to a few jumps later and a former colleague of mine at Yelp, who I really deeply respected, was a Duolingo. And I just, remember thinking, you're a Duolingo? Do you know that I speak Spanish? I thought I was so special. Right. Long story short, everyone at Duolingo speaks like five languages and I only speak Incredible. a measly two and a half. Oh. But um, yeah, it's just like a lot of uh, networking and things connected. So the Yelp path led me eventually to Duolingo and it's just been a wild ride. It's been so great. Well, I, I want to get to this amazing business story inside of Duolingo that you've been right in the, in the center of. I want to sidebar just for a second because I'm so curious about uh, polyglots and and especially um, people that are American that speak multiple languages. And, and and you said something really interesting about everybody at Duolingo, you know, knows multiple languages. I'm, I'm really curious. Do they do they come to Duolingo knowing a couple and then learn more while the, while they are there? Are these sort of people that are passionately, you know, passionate about studying languages before they get there? Kind of kind of like you are, or or how does that work? That's a great question. I don't want to speak for others, but I think if I if I try to guess from my own experiences, when you enter the world of at least being able to be bilingual and you know another language, it's like you've untapped a whole community or network. It's just like really amazing to be able to communicate with people across that language barrier. No. Um, and so I think it, you know, one, because languages are connected to each other and, and, and there's so much shared between different languages at their root that that it lends itself to people that le- speak two languages thinking, oh, maybe I'll pick up a third, maybe I should tinker. So yeah, I think it's it's probably a matter of of people that speak at least one other language just having a general interest in picking up more. But we also, I mean, one of the perks of working in Duolingo too is like we get access to a lot of the features and products um, before a lot of our learners do. And so it benefits us and it benefits the the product team at the company for everyone at Duolingo to use the product. So I'm in, I've been in the Portuguese course for a while, but I've also checked out the Danish course. I've been in the Korean course. I've been in the uh, Scots Gaelic course. So it's fun to try to learn new languages. I can't say I'm super fluent in any of the ones I just rattled off, but I right. think it's probably the same. I'm working on them. I'll see you on the leaderboard there sometime. <laughs> yeah. My yep. French. My mediocre <laughs> French. Um, that, that's wonderful. Well, so, um, you, you know, it sounds like you've got an incredible collection of colleagues. I mean, but it, it seems like a, a truism that people who study multiple languages tend to be very interesting and um, curious people, I think. It, that, that Maybe that's too sweeping a generalization, but I, I think it may be true. I think it would a compliment. That's yeah, cool. Well, I think it's true, honestly. And, and uh, so you combine that with, you told me a little bit about um, you, you know, your background at community, which is, I think, um, something you've done a, a, a huge uh, initiative fairly recently on at, at Duolingo. Talk for a second before we get to that about the science and the, um, the product team at Duolingo, because some of the things I think that are going on there are really extraordinary in terms of doing sort of research-backed uh, learning and lessons and, you know, doing this in how many languages are there? Yeah, so we have 100 courses, and that supports over 40 languages. So one way to explain what the courses means is that they're taught in two different directions. Yes. So if you're learning learning Spanish from French, course, the Spanish course, is not the same as Spanish from English or Spanish from Italian. Amazing. And even if you reverse it, if you're learning French from Spanish, that course is not the same because there are going to be you know, words or phrases that are common in French that you would have to learn as a Spanish speaker or an English speaker that don't directly translate. There's cultural references and yeah. So it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Each course is individualized right now. Think about that. That's incredible. Yeah. Here, here I am very Anglo-centric and 
in thinking that everybody must be learning these things in English, and and that's that's apparently not the case at all. So yeah, yeah. What? But when you ask about the science of it, I'm mean, really proud to say, and I'm so glad you asked. Like a lot of people, and I feel fortunate when I say I work at Duolingo. The first thought is, oh, it's so cute, it's so fun, or oh, I can't believe Duo the owl. He's so unhinged and crazy on social, and it's a, such a creative company, and our product is, I think at front and center, free and fun. That's what we want people to think of because that's what makes learning engaging. Yep. But what we never want people to forget that attached to both fun and free is that it is effective. Yep. So efficacy is critical at Duolingo. And so sure, we have really cool product designers. We have animators animating features within the app to make it the app look beautiful. But behind all of those scenes are curriculum designers. We have former teachers, we have linguists like these are I've never worked with more people that with PhDs in my life. I'm talking actual experts in specific language curriculum design, um, experts in gaming. And so it's it's there's so much science behind how we teach. Yep. And the idea is we kind of cover it up so you don't know that you're learning as much as you are because it should just feel lighthearted and fun. Yep. But it is effective. That's incredible. Well, look, that's that's as a um, user of Duolingo, that's been my experience that it's it's clear after some amount of time that some real magic is going on behind the scenes because it works. Like I come back around to the thing that I missed three times, three lessons ago, and that I was sure I would never be able to remember. And all of a sudden I remember it. And and it's really extraordinary. It sort of feels like some sort of black magic going on behind the scenes, but it's uh, it's 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 impressive. And part of it is those famously quirky sentences, right? Like there there are a few naysayers out there that say, when am I ever going to need to know the bear drinks beer? Right. And the idea is not that we need you to know that the bear drinks beer, but it may come up in conversation. Oh, no, thanks. I wouldn't. I don't want a beer. Or, oh, did you go to the zoo and see the bear? Like there are going to be times where you need to know those words and you'll have forgotten that you learn them in an, a non-traditional funny way that's more memorable than a boring sentence of, may I have a beer, please, you know? That's fascinating. Yeah, a lot of the memory research says that that, um, uh, you know, making it stand out in some important way, a, a, lot, a lot of memory techniques involve using a visual that's really strange, that that would sort of stand out in your memory as unusual, like a, you know, a bear drinking a beer, for instance. <laughs> yeah. I'm probably not going to forget that one for a little while. <laughs> it's incredible. So, so kind of getting back to our story here. So so all of this sort of culminated for you in joining Duolingo and uh, you were involved, I think, in various marketing uh, areas and roles. And then all of a sudden this idea came up and I think that it was something that you were championing yourself. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the very beginnings of, of what now has become a pretty impressive uh, uh, program you've got? Yeah, I'm beaming here because I, I still pinch myself when I think about this. So there was a marketing offsite, and this is almost five years ago now. It was in 2019. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we were, our marketing team at the time was rather small. We had just hired our first CMO, and she was this, she's since retired, but incredible person, strong leader. She had a background at Yahoo and Nintendo, all these big, reputable companies. Wow. And she came in to build the marketing team. And so this is this little offsite. And if, if I'm not wrong, I think we were like 15 people. And this was like our international, this was everybody on marketing. Yeah. Um, and I was in an initiative called Duolingo Events, which is now been Sunset, but it was a virtual event product for people to meet virtually and exchange information and become friends and speak in a shared language for practicing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a fantastic team to be on. Uh, but someone at this marketing offsite, it was not me, said, you know, we have, we call our users, we call them learners. We have so many learners that are so enthusiastic about what we do. They email us by the by the thousands saying, what can I do to be involved? I love Duolingo. I love learning language. How could I help? You know, I just want to know more about Duolingo. And so we thought, how do we service these fans? How do we let them know what's going on with us? And what can we do that our competitors aren't doing? And that's maybe hosting an event. What if we have a conference that just updates these energetic and enthusiastic folks about the new products and features that we have coming up. Yeah. And so the idea was born at that uh, that marketing offsite and Cami, our CMO said, I like this idea, let's explore it. But you know, with such a small team, you know, what resource, like who do we have to do something like that? And I just sort of like look around the room and here I am having just spent six years at Yelp and then in directing marketing and event at 
efforts at this liquor company where we have big events and big budgets. And I thought, how different is a conference from an event? Like, right. I can do that. I can do that. This is something I know quite a lot about. Yeah. yeah. And so instead of just entertainment, there's going to be some talks. That doesn't sound too different. Yeah. And so I raised my hand and said, put me on this project. And it, the turnaround, and it wasn't just me. There were a couple other folks that helped. But the turnaround was about 60 days with a pretty tight budget. And we knew our CEO was going to be traveling to London. So we're like, oh, that's flashy. Let's just do it in London. Oh. We found a conference center and we, you know, enabled as many people to come as the, as the venue could fit, which was like 300 people. And uh, we barely promoted it. I think we let people know with like 30 days notice. And people came from all over the world. It was remarkable. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wait, and, so it, th th this, I mean, I think we want to sort of put a, a, a point on this because of how extraordinary this is. So this is... 60 days from zero, like hadn't even been conceived of yet, or let's say 61 days, um, to 300 people from all over the world at a venue in London with your first user conference, learner conference uh, ever. Yeah. And that it, is extraordinary. And I mean, if I had footage to share with you, which I do, and it's locked away, I'm not, I, I'm not like the proudest of that conference. It really was sure. slapped together. And then my biggest mistake, and I own this as, as an event, um, and project manager is that I forgot to hire an MC. I just sort of was like, okay, there, there'll be a talk and another talk. And so I'm also not only coordinating and running production of that day event, but I, but I end up running on stage. the MC. Yeah, that was fantastic. It, it was very DIY and very fun. Yes. And the end result, I'm happy to say, is the CEO and the CMO said, there is something to this. We really like this. It's 2019. And they said, do it again next year. We'll blow it up. We'll do it bigger. We'll do it in New York. Um, so for it, reference, what time of year was this in 2019? Because I, I, I think we know we all know what happened on the global stage yeah. later. So yeah, what, so this was August, August, August 2019. Got it. And so I'm planning and I've got a venue locked in. We're about to pay the deposit. I've got um, Trevor Noah locked in. We're about to pay his deposit. So wait, so, so you're you're planning this event for now August 2020 or when was the is that what the yeah. follow-up was going to be oh my it's going to be August 2020 in New and York so, yeah. how yeah. big of a venue were you looking at just out of curiosity so this comes from my personal preference having attended lots of events and conferences I know we could get 7,000 people 10,000 people I think the sweet spot especially for a year two of an event that only had 300 people the sweet spot for managing lines to the bathroom yes. lines yes. for food is under a thousand. I yep. really wanted to have eight, nine hundred people yep. to really hone our skills and feel like we figured out how to host this event because then we could maybe move it internationally, for example. So but that's three X over the prior year anyway. That's pretty darn good. Yeah. So it's pretty conservative. Like I didn't want to go nuts with the with a bunch of stuff. Cause it's sure. similar to Duolingo's mission, right? Duolcon is intended to be free and accessible. So yeah. it also, you know, we were gonna spend a ton of money to host a lot of people, but we care about quality and presentation. Yeah. So we want to give food and coffee and snacks and swag. And so the budget changes a lot when you're like, let's get 7,000 people in a, in an arena and give them food. And it just felt like a, quite a big leap. And, it, and it's a lot less intimate and a lot more impersonal, e even even with an incredibly enthusiastic community. So had you gotten to the point of um, making this available to attendees to sign up for yet? Or where, where were you in that part of things? Man. Everything changed. We had kind of quietly announced we'd relaunched the Dualcon landing page where people yeah. register with some teaser details about coming to New York summer of 2020. And that's it. We hadn't announced Trevor Noah. We yeah. hadn't announced other speakers or the lineup yeah. uh, or the specific date. And so that worked out well because I believe it was as late as February when I built this framework and presented to the CEO. I said, we have a couple options here. Yes. We don't do it at all. We right. do it next year yes. or we find a way to do this virtually. Yes. Um, and also, mind you, in the time that I planned the first dual con and was planning the second, I had taken a big leap as somebody that's not a risk taker. And I told my then manager on the events team, I said, you know, I'm somebody that's really successful when I have like one thing to focus on. And I sense dual con is going to be a big project. I think this has got to become a full time role. And I had pitched and written a JD for myself and said, like, I want to do just this and I want to exit this other role that I'm doing and put 100% into it. And so here I am thinking, if we don't do DualCon, 
do I not have a job? Uh, so I also, of course, was considering we need to do this virtually. This really, really, really needs to happen. And by the way, for somebody who's risk averse, that's very entrepreneurial of you to to uh, to put it together that way. That's amazing. So so then news is breaking, everything's changing. March, April, twenty twenty. At some point, you said the only way to do this is to go virtual. And so talk to us a little bit about that pivot, like what what happened at that point. Yeah, I mean, part of my pitch to the CEO, who I'm grateful was totally on board, was, you know, let's meet people where they are. And sure, a lot of people are racing to have virtual events and the whole world is doing virtual, but like our learners wanted to hear from us and we had budget allocated for this. Like, let's just, let's just throw the pasta at the wall, see what sticks. Let's, let's figure it out because we have a captive audience that was waiting for an update and maybe they'll show up for us online. Yeah. Um, and so calculating my OKRs, like how am I, how am I going to decide whether this is a win or, you know, hit or a miss? And I thought, okay, it would be tremendous if we 10 X our viewership, right? Like we were going to have 300 people in London. We we're going to have a thousand people in New York. What if we 10 X that? What if our viewership was 10,000 people? Right. That sounds like a big number. Huge, right? Huge. Yes, amazing. And so, and so, I was just going to ask to to talk about numbers, and then what happened? A <laughs> hundred and eighteen thousand people tuned in during our broadcast. Now, simultaneously, we did not have one hundred eighteen thousand people, which is good. That it was, is good. It was barely manageable at forty thousand. I mean, we had lots of people on. We we broadcast on. Uh, Twitch, and then we restreamed onto YouTube so that yes. people kind of find their own accessible right. entry, low barrier to entry for us. Like, again, everyone's racing out there with conference platforms and trying to sell me on, oh, you want to use this conference platform or that one. But they all had, like, you need to give first name, last name, right. where you live. And our learners, are they care about their privacy, and we do too. We're not trying to capture their information. Dual Con is a gift to them. Yes, yes. Um, and so, yeah, having it on YouTube just meant it was more accessible. It was yeah. free for them. It was free for us. And so we've actually continued with that for the last few years. But yeah, 118,000. Like right, that feels like the right brand alignment. I mean, that that just sort of sort of makes sense. So, I mean, I, I guess I don't know much about what, I mean, obviously YouTube's got plenty of, of uh, infrastructure to support something that large, but that must also sort of tip the scales towards the higher end of what they see as, uh, you know, on, on a, an annual basis. I mean, I don't know how big it gets. I know there were some things they did during the pandemic that probably had tens of millions of people, but I would imagine that you were in the top 1% or 0.1%. Uh, I, you know, I should talk to our account manager over there and find out because it, 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 is, it is not a small number. And I will say that where we saw the most impact, which sort of uh, affected the event, as it were, is that the chat was bonkers. Like yeah. you, there are there are tools you can use. We had moderators. I had forty colleagues at Duolingo who changed their names on Google, so it would say like Duo staff and yes. then their team. So we knew they were representatives and they could answer questions. And I'm thinking this is going to feel like such a great event because people will ask questions, they'll get questions answered, and the chat scrolled like this. I mean, you couldn't see. It was just hi from Bolivia. Hi from Brazil, hi from Sri Lanka. It was nuts, but it, it was still just a really fun experience. Isn't that incredible? Well, even just the energy, I think, of seeing that. I mean, that, that, that honestly, I don't know if it was Twitch that popularized it, but it feels like they did. That, that there's there's sort of this feel that you get when you see that stuff flying by with emojis and things that that is kind of invigorating and feels a little bit like you feel in a crowd. So so you probably had that kind of an impact going. <laughs> I hope so. I've worked hard to try to like make the chat a better experience and I, honestly this year i think i'm giving up i think we're just gonna let chat go rogue because uh, just free too many people go free that's amazing well look if you ever solve that problem you've got a whole nother product company that you can probably build out of it so wait about. so okay so so this is incredible you you 100x to your expectations um and you had planned sufficiently to be on a platform that could actually accommodate that kind of i mean usually if somebody says yeah we we missed our number um you know, to the upside by a hundred X, everything melts, but you, you were able to pull it off, which is incredible. And this already represented a pretty big pivot from where you started. Let's hear a little bit more about what's happened since then. Cause I, I, I love this story for all of its like pivots, follow what, what the community is asking for, like do what, um, what, what, uh, seems to be working and set aside the other stuff. So, so maybe bring us up to speed over what happened 
post pandemic and and where you want to go from here. Sure, sure. Yeah, actually, I should first touch on, you know, we had signed Trevor Noah for 2020. And then I felt pretty strongly that if we weren't in New York doing this big splashy event in Brooklyn, I just didn't think that our 2019 Duocon, like the leap to have like Trevor Noah, it felt just totally out of the blue. Right. And so I actually thought we got to go back to his agency and say, look, we want Trevor, you've agreed, but can we just change the dates and let's push Trevor to 2021 mm. and let's knock 2020 out of the park. And yeah. that was just a lucky guess because of course, 2020 was super successful, but you know, 2019 speakers were primarily duos, people that work at Google. Yeah. 2020 speakers were a mix of a really successful language podcast host as our MC. Uh, we had linguists and college professors. So nobody here is like an A-list celebrity. And I, I don't know if you've worked with celebrities before, and that was my first experience um, hiring Trevor Noah. But, and, and for good reason, the, the their agency that represents them, they want to know who else is in the lineup because it has to make sense. Hmm. And I was really glad I didn't say, oh, it's a bunch of these college professors and then a bunch of people that work at our company and Trevor Noah, because that's a lot of weight to put on somebody that's that successful. And so I'm really glad that they very quickly said, oh, sure, you're, you know, we'll sign him for 2021 and we move that right along. So 2020 was still a great lineup. I loved everybody that participated, but that was the year that we really figured out how to completely virtually produce this conference. Amazing. Um, we also made the change to, we we decided if we're not doing anything at a venue, we're not doing anything live. Mm. Um, and I kind of looked to Apple's events, which is funny to say, because they're like so many millions of dollars and so many hundreds, if not thousands of people involved in their events. Sure. Um, but I, I looked to them as sort of like this like North Star metric. How do we copy what they're doing? Their live, their events aren't live anymore. Why? You can control the audio. You can edit speakers that are that are tapped to be on stage that that own the product or on the product team, but maybe aren't professional speakers. You know, you get the magic of editing. Um, I know, just, by the way, live demos, live demos are are always a problem. Yes, and I've watched so many conferences now over the last four years that are uh, a mix of live or or pre recorded, and yeah. I've seen huge brands that I won't even name brands. I love where their conferences go down Yeah, because they went live and I'm like, why are you live? Wow. So jumping to the subsequent years, 2020 big hit, everybody at the company was impressed. I was very happy that they were. Um, and then 2021 is where we brought in Trevor Noah and we brought in Pat Oswalt to be our MC. Cause he's been a long time fan of Duolingo, mm -hmm. funny, jovial. We thought that would work really well. Um, we brought in some other linguists and external experts. And so we had a mix of, you know, folks that use and love Duolingo or in the language world, folks that are fans. And then, of course, Trevor Noah, if, if people don't know, the reason he made a lot of sense for us to talk to is because he speaks fluently five languages, but is familiar with about eight. Wow. So I was going to ask you exactly that. That seemed like that must be the fit. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and happy to say that in the interview himself, we got it on video. He says he uses Duolingo. He's mentioned us on his Netflix comedy special. So it's really nice to to interact with and engage with and put people up on a pedestal that love our products too, that we also love and admire. Wow. Um, so Trevor was a great fit. And then last year, we worked with a uh, chef and humanitarian, Chef Jose Andres. Uh -huh. He's from Spain. Yep. Um, he's well-known in Latin America where we have a lot of viewers. Yep. Uh, tremendous, tremendous efforts in Ukraine and it hurricane katrina he's done amazing things to help people in emergency situations um but we thought it would be really fun to talk to another humanitarian about like the language of food and how you can communicate through food but both he and our ceo and co-founder luis speak spanish oh. and so last year's pivot was to incorporate a more international feel with dual con this is an international conference um you'd be surprised in the u.s to hear that not everyone on earth knows who trevor noah is he feels super famous in the U.S. and obviously in South Africa, uh, but not super famous in, I don't know, Korea, for example. Yes. Um, so yes. yeah, last year we filmed segments in Korean. We filmed segments in Spanish. Uh, we just really broadened our horizons by producing content that was in other languages because we have subtitles for everybody that's following along. So, that, so that's amazing. I was just thinking about, uh, it reminds me of what you said earlier about having um, more courses than languages because you have to go both directions. So you have the same challenge all of a sudden here with subtitling everything. Um, you're going from uh, several languages to, how many, how many languages did you subtitle in for these, for these events? 
So we went above and beyond in 2020 and we offered languages, we offered eight different languages as options for subtitles. And when we went and tracked it, and it breaks my heart for people that just sort of lose out on this, we went and tracked it, it's something like a whopping 20 to 30% of people are, are using Spanish subtitles. Mm -hmm. And then another like 40% in English. Mm -hmm. And then after that it's Portuguese and then it drops. So if we only had like, I hate to say, cause thousands of people is not nothing, but if we have like 4,000 people tuning in wanting Korean subtitles, it just, we don't have the resources for that. It was such a big right. lift for a show that size. So for the last three years, we've opted in for English, Spanish, and Portuguese to kind of cover our bases of the, the bulk of our audience. Yep. But that is another reason we pre-produce is that we have time to thoughtfully and carefully translate and transcribe, or sorry, transcribe and translate yep. all of the content so yep. that we can enable people to choose subtitles in a language that enables them to follow along. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, and this is something I think we're um, a, a bit blind to in the U.S. because we just sort of assume everybody uh, uh, speaks English. And um, it, it actually is true, though, as, as you're sort of pointing out here, that most people in other countries, that the number one language that people learn is English, and then number two is probably Spanish. There also happen to be um, probably more Spanish speakers. I, mean, I, I remember my Spanish teacher saying, hey, if you can speak Spanish and English, you can speak almost anywhere in the in the uh you know the americas right which is mostly true we need brazil or brazilian portuguese rather and we need uh french for uh for parts of canada but that's but great. that's pretty good you know to, to uh to have that much coverage with with just two languages so makes sense that you would have to make that choice and and, and uh, focus on those, those languages that's right yeah so yeah so plans for 2023 are underway we huh? know the date that's in october what, we're experimenting. What's that? What, when in October? Let's go ahead and put that. We'll put that in the show notes too. Yeah, it's October 11. Okay, great. At 9 a.m. Pacific. Amazing. And is this an all day event, I'm assuming? You know, it isn't. This year we're actually experimenting with cutting the programming way down. So wow. my, my goal for this year is we've had our programs be as long as four hours. And honestly, we survey participants and people that are registered and attended and they love it. But Everybody's online. There's so much competing noise out there when you're That's on the internet. Point. And so in order to keep people engaged and excited, I think what we could do, it's a benefit to everybody involved, is really keep it super tight. So all of my 10 to 15 minute talks, I'm telling people like 10 is the absolute, we're going to turn on that like Oscars music for you, like 10 minutes and you're out. So I'm thinking like five minute talks. So we're going to have more product talks and announcements than ever before, but they're going to be shorter. Yep. Um, and, and even our interviews, like the Trevor Noah interview between Trevor and Luis, our co-founder and CEO, I was fascinated. I was hooked. Um, and that was like a 25, 30 minute interview. We're going to try to keep our A-list celebrity interviews this year down to like the 10, 15 minutes if we can do it. That's going to be um, amazing if you can pull it off. That's yeah. No, we're looking at like a two hour event. Yeah. Amazing. Well, you, you mentioned it. You, you've been working with A-list celebrities. This is probably something you didn't expect when you uh, embarked on this path. A bunch of not at all. What is? I mean, I just have to ask. Like, what does that feel like? What? What? What is that like to be sort of, you know, uh, talking about, um, you know, hey, Trevor Noah, you know, has joined us and Patton Oswalt and like, I mean, these are these are pretty big names. And how does that? How does that all feel when you when you sort of sit with it and think about it? It it really surprises me all the time, and I think where it's it's most exciting to me is I have a lot of. Uh, choice in who we partner with. I, I I get so much creative freedom from our CEO, who's my biggest stakeholder in this project. Mm -hmm. And so it feels really nice to be a big decision maker and, and decide, okay, who's the right fit for this conference? I certainly run the ideas up the chain when needed. And I certainly want other people's opinions and input because I'm not like the creative mastermind that knows all. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, all projects are better when they're cross-functional and part of a group effort. Um, but it's been amazing because I am a firm believer in Duolingo's mission about accessibility in education and providing high quality education for free, right? Yeah. And so when I think of who is aligned with our mission in the world, it's always fascinating, talented, worldly educated people that I probably would never cross paths with in my normal life, you know? Like, it'd be cool to meet a Kardashian, sure. But when I'm thinking of of who is truly aligned with our mission about education and equality, it's it's like really top-notch, fascinating people. And so I, I can tease for you now, we we formally definitely have um, one speaker. One is 
One is a tentative either for this year or next year. So I'm happy to leak that too, if you want, but I can oh, tell you that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is that something that, so when can we get a hold of that? Is that something you're, you're uh, at liberty to discuss now, or is it something that you can, you, you're going to need to wait on? No, I can discuss it. I mean, we can let it leak a little bit. There, there's nothing holding me back except getting that launch page redesigned. But yeah, we're working with some exciting people and I'm actually filming in June. So I'm flying to London and our A-list celebrity interview between our co-founder and CEO, Luis Bonan, yeah. he's going to be talking with Malala Yousafzai oh from my. Pakistan. So she now lives in London. So we're flying to London to film with her and interview her and talk about her foundation and her you know, uh, advocacy for education, especially for women and girls. Uh, just think that she's going to be a great uh, thought partner and person to talk to um, about Dulcon. Well, she she's absolutely extraordinary, of course, in her own right. And and what a perfect match too for for you guys and what you guys are doing. That's incredible. That's really incredible. Now, I, ha I have to also say because we we talked about this just a tiny bit beforehand. Um, that you, you mentioned. Uh, You've got kids, you've got two twins, which is incredible yeah. because I'm the son of an identical twin and my sister has fraternal twins. There's lots of twins going in my family too. So we've, we've compared notes on, on all things twin. And uh, you were talking about how you're trying to explain to them some of these people that you're working with, Malala in particular, and, and maybe they just don't quite think that's as big a deal as, as the next snack that they're gonna get. Absolutely, they're more excited about goldfish crackers right now, but I will say, you know, and I don't know if you're aware, but Duolingo has a, a another product called Duolingo ABC. It's a separate app. It's a literacy app for kids. And I'm really happy to say that as a result of the ABC app, which shows a, a youthful portrayal of all of our world characters, yep. so all of the animated characters you see in the language app are now younger versions of themselves in Duolingo oh, ABC. Smart. Yeah. My kids think, I mean, they think Duolingo is cooler than Disney. So they ask me all the time, is Duo going to be at the office today, which is Duo the Owl? Um, and so they do think that part of my job is cool, but we, yeah, when I, I bought a book about Malala and I wanted to teach them about her impact and yes. how inspirational she is as a woman. And yes. they're like, doesn't yes. matter. It, do it doesn't register yet. That kind of stuff is almost impossible to ever convey as a parent. What's going to happen is in 10 years, they're going to come home and say, mom, I just learned about this incredible woman, Malala, and she's just the most amazing. And you're just going to say, yeah, I know. I know. Right. We know this. <laughs> I was trying to tell you this, and that's okay. And that that is that is uh, one of the most glorious things about being a parent, and it's just the way it is. So, well, that's incredible. I didn't know about that product. I didn't know you've got this sort of kid version of it, and and um, that's amazing. And so that's something that then is targeting what ages? So it is a literacy app targeting kids. I had my kids playing around with it at like two plus, but it's typically for kids meant to be about three and over. I yeah. believe it's three to nine. Mm. Um, but really what you do is you, when you download the app, it's free like the Duolingo language app. When you download the app, you insert as a parent your child's name and then their age so that we can target where they may be in their educational uh, career. Yeah. And when you type in their name, the app also then knows it. So it teaches them how to read and write their name. So that's kind of a customization ability that it has, but there's all kinds of stories. There's this sort of learning path that you follow where you like trace letters and you match words. It's all about phonetics and sight words. And it's, you know, instead of being a language app, right now it exists in English and we're launching in Spanish. Mm. Um, it is primarily just for, for people that speak that, la that, that language natively, sorry. Uh. So if you are English speaking and you want your kids to start catching up with knowing the ABCs, yep. you download ABC and they start learning in English. That's amazing. I didn't even know about that. I mean, my kids are a bit out of that range. I've got uh, teenagers, so I, so they're pretty far along the path. And actually, uh, all three of them use or have used Duolingo uh, themselves, which is pretty cool. I've never uh, heard that. If I was a, a new parent, that that sounds like that would be an incredible app. Telling people all the time, you got to get it. It's free because it, you know, it doesn't have ads. It's I don't want to brag too much because screen time, we know. When nobody wants screen time for their kids, if you're going to do screen time, this is valuable screen time. Like there's no, there's no, you know, pay to play. There's no trick. There's no money involved. You just download the app and let them have that tablet for 20, 30 minutes. And then they walk away having learned something that's really valuable. That's incredible. Well, look, as long as we're on the, the, the topic, you know, one thing I always like to ask other folks who are also parents, because I'm a parent with, with three kids. 
Um, I used to have hair before I had teenagers, I like to say, and, and uh, things- That's a lot from food, actually. Yeah. Yes, yes, that, that will happen. That's one of the known consequences or side effects of having kids. Um, but I'm always curious to, to hear, especially for people who've had the kind of success and, and ambitions that you've had, how do you balance this? You know, you, you're, you're, a, you're a parent to twins, no less, um, and you've done this extraordinary thing at Duolingo and created this um, amazing, uh, you know, global event kind of out of nothing that now involves A-list celebrities and, and you know, hundreds of thousands of participants. And, uh, you know, how, how, do you, how do you find that balance and how, do you, how have you sort of figured out your priorities on all this? Yeah, oh, I've naturally had a lot of energy throughout life. So I, I'm just really driven by, I'm mission driven, right? Like I, I'm really driven by Duolingo right now in my career. Our mission to connect and, and unite people, uh, you know, language is inherently social. So that's a driver for me. But mm -hmm. before I started working at Duolingo, because I, I started working at Duolingo uh, full time when my kids were four months old, mm -hmm. I actually was in that blissed out stage um, between roles. Like I, I wanted to sort of, stop working, enjoy being with my kids. It, it was a little bit of a um, high risk pregnancy, you know, as a lot of twin pregnancies are. So for my own sanity, I was like, I'm going to leave the role where I currently am employed and I'm just going to find something when I find something. And it could be in a couple of years, m maybe it'll be in one year. And I didn't really have a set plan, but I had considered the option, which is a totally valid option to have a single income household, you know, with my husband and then just stay at home because I knew I was going to love these kids and I knew I was going to love being a parent. Yep. And it, as soon as they were born, I looked at them and they're both girls and I looked at them and I thought, man, I want to show you, you could have it all. And I got to do stuff for you. Like I want to work for you and I want to provide for you and, and having dual income and finding a way, which is not easy to have two full-time working parents, you know, making those sacrifices, I feel like will pay off for my family, my personal family, you know, in the long run, I just want to be able to provide for them and show them that if you want it as a woman, you could be at home or you could be at work or you could do both. Yep. You could, whatever works for you. And so I, I feel really proud of that decision um, because they're, they're proud of where I work. They think it's cool so far with what little they understand. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I just decided to go for it and it's been crazy and chaotic and there've been some sleepless nights, but um, it's been the best decision I've ever made. And it, it, I'm fortunate that, you know, Raising my family is a community effort. I've got in-laws nearby. They're obviously school age now at yes. five. They're in a pre-kinder program. So experience when they start going to school and you get some hours in the day. It's it's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing what you get done. I, I love that. I mean, I, I love that idea of, um, it, you know, our, I, I feel like our children really need to see parents who are thriving. And Yes, they need nurturing and they need support and they need our presence and our attention. And that's a hard thing in this world where everything else is vying for our attention. It's a really hard thing when our work is vying for our attention. But I think it's it's often lost how much they also need to see parents who are thriving uh, uh, you know, in their own right, outside of just the relationship with the kid. And your kids at you know five or so years old are probably just starting to key into that, right? Yeah, yeah, and what and whatever thriving is, right? Like thriving, thriving may be volunteering, thriving may be part time work. Yes, I mean, I have a a mentor of sorts who is a total like powerhouse of a woman. She works so much harder than I do. Yes, she's gone from her three kids longer than I am, right? Like, and that's okay. That works out for the dynamics of her family, and I so respect that. And I'm sure her kids are fine with that. And I look at that and I think there's nothing wrong with that. And yep. and I'm very lucky that I, I get a little bit more flexibility. So it's about what you want to sacrifice and what drives you and makes you happy. And I found a company that allows a lot of balance. And so I'm extremely lucky. I have to acknowledge that. Like a lot of it is luck with how great Duolingo is at supporting working parents. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's just whatever whatever that success factor is. is uh, parents Kids want to see their parents happy. So if, if you're happy working, then work. I love it. I love it. I'm really glad I asked that question. Well, let me, uh, as we're kind of rounding the bend here, I got one last question for you. And um, it, it has to do with your vision for what happens with this event going forward. If I, if I were to sort of project you forward, put you in a time machine, it's five years from now. So uh, that puts us in 2028, which seems like the far future. I mean, but, but five years down the road, 
what's happening with this event? What what have you achieved? What are you doing? Um, you know, we're we're coming up on the eve of the event, and and what's going on? Like, what 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 do you think will will unfold five years from now? Well, I know Duolingo people often think of it as a language company. We're an educational company. We have different verticals. I talked to you about ABC. That's a whole different product. We also have a math app. You know, we also, you know, we're coming out with different verticals. So I see a future where Duocon is less of a specific, like, language-centric conference. And maybe there's an opportunity for regional events. And maybe it's biannual or maybe it's quarterly. Um, and so we could service our learners and our fans either by vertical or by region. I see it being more multilingual. I see it potentially traveling to where we film it. Um, you know, it, it, it's really tough as someone, even that speaks another language and has lived abroad and traveled abroad, it's really tough to escape, you know, my own culture and my own uh, idea of who is relevant, who is famous, who is interesting. Yep. And so a lot of the feedback still years into my real effort to make this an international conference, you know, people are saying it feels very Western or it feels very American focus and we are an american company we're based in the u.s but how do we make it feel and look and be truly international so yeah i think you know basing the production elsewhere having regional events having an entire dual con in mandarin like maybe that's our that's future so. amazing it reminds me a little bit about uh, of what ted has done with the ted brand and the, the main ted conference yeah. once a year and uh then tedx which is everywhere that sounds exactly. great yeah, that's incredible. Well, it sounds like a lot of amazing things to come with this event. What an extraordinary story this is, and what a wonderful uh, opportunity to chat with you and hear more about it. This has been a real joy, Katie. Thank you so, so much for for being with us today. I really appreciate it, John. It's been such a fun chat. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you. 